Hi, I'm Savannah Shine, Director of the Ovarian Cancer Program at SHARE. This presentation is called Ethnic Disparities in Gynecologic Cancer by Dr. Kevin Holcomb. Dr. Holcomb is the Director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Weill Cornell Medical Center. This webinar was recorded on June 15, 2015. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Holcomb, Director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Weill Cornell Medical Center. Um, and uh, please, please, I pass the mic to you, Dr. Holcomb. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to address uh, the membership. And uh, I enjoy speaking on this topic because I, <clears throat> I find a lot of a lot of people are aware of disparities and other areas of medicine, but not so much uh, with cancer, and I think it'll be uh, maybe interesting and some new news for some, um, and maybe a review for others. But as you mentioned, the topic of disparities in gynecologic cancer that I would like to address today. Um, okay, a lot of this information that I'm going to be addressing today came out of some work I did with a task force that was charged by the Society of G1 Oncology to, um, to sort of look at what's been done on healthcare disparities and GYN cancers and to make some recommendations on how we might start addressing these. And so this Gynecologic Cancer Disparity Task Force is uh, uh, formed and the authors of this review article are mentioned here, including uh, some of the authors here have done quite a bit of the work on these papers that I'll be telling you about. Um, to start off with, so we're all speaking the same language, what exactly is a health disparity? Well, the National Institutes of Health describe it and define it as a, a difference in the incidence, the prevalence, the mortality, and the burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. Um, keep in mind, this doesn't say it explains why the difference is there. It's just an admission that there is a difference either in the prevalence or the outcome of a disease. And health disparities can be on many different lines. Um, and there's lots of data published on, in the literature on, on the age, it's showing disparities on, uh, based on age, uh, definitely based on insurance status, on um, geographical differences globally and within the United States. And, and also, there's a fair amount of literature on ethnic differences or racial differences in, uh, in uh, outcomes. And it's interesting because while we're doing so much examination of healthcare disparities now, this has clearly been a problem uh, since the formation of this country. And I, and I think a lot of people think of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a civil rights activist and that he was interested in labor unions and civil rights, and he was, but uh, many people aren't aware of this quote, all, uh, out of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking. So, I find that really interesting for a man who saw so many uh, inequalities and so much injustice that he felt this this uh, injustice or inequality in healthcare was to him the most shocking. I imagine because he saw healthcare as a human right um, far past a, a civil right. And if you're living in New York City, I don't know how many people are calling in from outside, but it obviously it's going to affect a city like New York because we're so diverse here. This is uh, Evan, uh, information from the 2000 uh, census. There were about 8 million New Yorkers. And you can see um, about a quarter of the city is black, not Hispanic. About 28% is Hispanic, 36% non-Hispanic white, um, and about 10% Asian or Pacific Islander. And then the rest is made up of a combination of American Indian, Alaskan, and other uh, quote unquote races. And when you look at where our foreign population comes from, of which there's almost 3 million foreign-born New York uh, City residents, 20% um, coming from the Caribbean, non-Hispanic, uh, Latin America, a uh, huge contribution of 32%, 19.4% European, 24% Asian, 3.2% African. So we're living in one of the most diverse cities in the world. So you're going to expect to have an effect with um, healthcare disparities in a city like New York. I think I wanted to start off a little bit broad to just get us thinking about what is it, what does race really mean? Um, and and when, especially when you talk about science, is race is even a, a valid scientific concept? And people have very, very different uh, opinions about this, and they, they run a spectrum. Uh, Harold Freeman, who was the first African-American president of the American Cancer Society, and he was the director of 
the breast cancer service at Harlem Hospital for many years. Um, he wrote a white paper uh, advising the National Institute of Health when he was president of the American Cancer Society, and he says, uh, race is a social construct, and it's produced by our nation's social and political history. It's not a valid biologic concept. He said, race is a surrogate for socioeconomic status, culture, and health behaviors that may impact cancer outcome, and that we need to look at race not as a biologic indicator, but as an indicator of what happens to people socially. And I guess his opinion, whether right or wrong, goes to the heart of the question, is race a good marker for um, a genetic predisposition? And, and to answer that question, I think you have to look at what we know about the human genome now. We've, we've, we've cloned the entire human genome. And what's interesting, one of the things that comes out of that, that effort is the fact that we are so much alike. Um, if you think, think of there's in population genetics, there's a, a concept called pi. And pi is the average proportion of nucleotide differences between any two random homo sapiens. If you just picked up anyone next to you on the train and wondered how much do I differ from this person by DNA, you're going to find a different nucleotide uh, sequence every 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 1,500 base pairs, which means that any random two human beings are 99.9% .9 alike by DNA. And there's only a 0.1% difference. And when you consider the three old world populations, Asia, Africa, Europe, and you ask the question, where is the majority of genetic variation? Is it inside of these groups or between these groups? It's surprising to find out that 85 to 90 percent of genetic variation actually exists within the groups, and only an additional 10 to 15 percent of variation exists. Um, uh, I'm sorry, between, it, the majority of, exists within the groups. There's only 10 to 15 percent of the variation that's between the groups. So what we know from population genetics is that if you're seeing big differences in outcome uh, for health-related outcomes, um, that it's not likely that there's a genetic explanation just from the beginning that uh, we are so much alike and that these concepts of race um, don't really stand up that well. Uh, this this uh, study by uh, Jordan Wooding looked at different polymorphism in the um, genetic code to sort of, could you, could you cluster pe people into races based on genetics? And they found that um, clustering of individuals did correlate with geographic origin and ancestry, um, and they had some traditional concepts of race that they clustered around, but the correlations were imperfect because genetic variation tended to be distributed in a continuous overlapping fashion. And their feeling was that direct assessment of di disease-related genetic variation will ultimately yield more accurate and beneficial information. And what they're saying is that diseases have genetics in common that are going to be more important than the genetics of what we define as races. So um, I just wanted to sort of uh, frame the conversation when we start looking at these differences. Um, with regard to racial and ethnic health care disparities, there have been a number of, of uh, publications that have shown that there are disparities in outcomes in all the leading causes of mortality in the United States. Some of them are very well-known studies. The first uh, study we have listed here um, looked at heart disease and gave, uh, gave doctors, actors actually, who were giving a script of symptoms, and they were the same symptoms. And what they found was they wanted to see how often would a cardiologist refer somebody for a catheterization to see if they had a blocked coronary artery. And black women, given the exact same symptoms, were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization than white men. With cerebral vascular diseases, um, a U.S. nursing home study found that blacks and Asians and Hispanics received warfarin, a blood thinner, much less often than non-Hispanic whites, um, and that is a known prevention strategy for stroke. Um, when it comes to kidney disease, Blacks have been found to be less likely candidates for renal transplant, and when they are candidates, less likely to be referred for a transplant than white. So there's evidence outside of cancer of healthcare disparities, and um, I wanted to focus on some of the cancer disparities. I, I also think we have to keep in mind the socioeconomic impact um, of race in our society, and, and look at the impact of, for example, this slide shows you a, a paper from the SEER database a large cancer database, and it looked at breast cancer survival by race and insurance status from 1999 to 2000. And what you can see on, this, on these three graphs is that whether you're white, African-American, or Hispanic, 
If you have private insurance, you have a much better chance of surviving than if you're uninsured or have Medicaid, regardless of your ethnicity. In fact, that impact of insurance status was so strong in this uh, study, it was stronger than the impact of a histologic grade of your tumor. And, and what's really troublesome, uh, troublesome is that in the African American, African -American and Hispanic patients, um, having no insurance actually had a better outcome than having Medicaid, uh, which suggests that just having access to care may not be the whole story. Um, it's access to quality care that may be playing a difference as well. And so there are health disparities in oncology, and they are based on race and ethnicity. There's uh, disparities based on socioeconomic status and age. And we can measure these disparities with the incidence, that's how many new cases there are per year, treatment differences, and survival differences. So I wanted to look at, uh, I know the title was originally broadcast as an ovarian cancer disparity, but I think it's really, you get a, a bigger feel for how complex the issue is if you look at a number of GYN malignancies. So I wanted to look at ovarian because it, it is the most lethal of the GYN malignancies. And I wanted to look at cervix because it's the most preventable, and uh, uterine because it's the most common. So let's start off with ovarian. When you look at ovarian cancer survival in the United States, oh, before I get into this, I want to say that it may seem like I'm restricting my talk to a comparison of African American and white women or black women and white women, but unfortunately our, our literature is limited. Uh, and there are very few studies that look at non-black groups or non-white groups and, and their relationship and their outcome with ovarian cancer. Um, and so I will just sort of summarize what's in the literature. This study from the American Cancer Society, uh, cancer, fact, cancer Facts and Figures from 2012, shows you what's happened over time. And if you look at the relative five-year survival from ovarian cancer, back in 1975 to 1977, black women actually had a higher five-year relative survival. Now, that's, that's strange compared to white women because you're talking about a time where aggressive surgical debulking really had not become completely embraced. Um, there was really only one uh, accepted chemotherapy for this, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. But as things started progressing and optimal debulking became recognized as important and chemotherapy options started to increase, you see a switch happen right around the late 1980s where the, the five-year relative survival of white women start going up and the relative survival for black women is actually going down. And so that decrease that happened by the late 80s remained the same. And when you look at the 2001 to 2007 time period, you see the, that the two survivals have pretty much switched places, where African-American women have the 36% relative five-year survival and, and white women have the 44%. And uh, people have postulated why this may be the case, and, and maybe it's the fact that um, as you have better treatments, you need access to those treatments, and if there's uh, disparities in healthcare access, you're going to see a widening of these outcome differences, and that appears to be what's happening in ovarian cancer. When you try to get to the drill down to what's the cause of these um, disparities, one very commonly used um, method of studying this is to see, are white women and black women re both receiving the standard care, the recommended care? And Harlan et al. in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2003 looked at the SEER database between 1991 and 1996, and they wanted to see if people were following the 1994 NIH consensus development guideline therapy. And, and that's just broadly saying that patients had surgery for debulking and six cycles of platinum-based therapy. They looked at 11,000, uh, I'm sorry, 1,100 patients overall, 118 of them being African-American and 125 being Hispanic. What they found was that 66% of patients with private insurance got uh, guideline care, and only 54% of patients with Medicaid, Medicare, or no insurance receive guideline therapy. So there is an impact on insurance status before you start looking at ethnicity. But in women without private insurance, if you just looked at the Medicare, the government-sponsored insurance, or no insurance, only 26% of African Americans and 34% of Hispanics receive guideline care but 51% of the white women, even without insurance, still got guideline care. The problem with studies like this is that it doesn't answer the question of why these other women did not receive um, guideline care. You don't know if it was comorbid 
medical illnesses, uh, it was prejudice on the part of the physicians or some other uh, access issues, transportation, all you know is that they did not get it. <clears throat> Rosebeck Parham did a similar study looking at the National Cancer Database. It was a much larger study. He looked at 36,000 women with ovarian cancer between 1985 and 1993. Uh, almost 2,500 of them were African American. And if you look at that uh, survival graph, you see that um, there's a, a significantly lower survival for African Americans. Um, they compared that survival, the top, the top graph being the survival of white women and the bottom graph being African American women. And their women, white women, uh, treated at the same facility as the black women and at different facilities, it didn't matter. They had a significantly improved survival. When they looked at the likelihood of receiving surgery and chemotherapy, they found that African American patients were less likely to receive surgery and chemotherapy. And this began, began really that conversation of, of are, are patients receiving the same guideline therapy. Um, and Basically, there have been a number of studies that have come to the same conclusion, population-based studies that say, does being African-American have an, a negative impact on your chances of surviving ovarian cancer? And they all consistently come to the same conclusion. Um, grosbeck Parham, we already discussed that paper, uh, about a 25% increased risk of death if you're African-American. Uh, Bill McGuire, 14% increased risk. Barnholtz et al., 30% increased risk. And it goes down the line. So it's pretty well accepted that there are differences in outcome uh, between black and white women with ovarian cancer. It seems to be tied to treatment differences, and those differences are actually widening over time, not getting more narrow. Um, but what about if you could guarantee that everyone got the same treatment? Can guideline adherent care eliminate disparities in epithelial ovarian cancer? Well. One of the ways you could study that was that if you looked at black and white women who were on multicenter trials, let's say gynecologic oncology group trials or SWOG trials, where it is protocol determined what people are getting. And that's what Farley did in 2009. They looked at over 1,300 women um, on seven phase three GOG trials, 97 women who were African American, and they saw the survival difference disappear. Progression-free survival for African-American women, 16.2 months versus 16.1 months for uh, Caucasian women. Median overall survival, no significant difference. Bristow, looking at Johns Hopkins, FIGO stage 3C patients, uh, Carol Brown at Memorial Sloan Kettering, looking at their population where treatment was um, standardized. Both showed no effect on survival, um, either overall or progression-free survival when you standardize the treatment. Now, Albane et al. Um, is the one outlier. They looked at five th phase three trials that were run through the Southwestern Oncology Group, and they still saw a negative impact on survival for patients who are African American uh, with a pretty high hazard ratio, 61% uh, 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 higher risk of, of death um, if you are African American. So I'd have to say the balance of the data suggests that equal care get you equal outcome in ovarian cancer, and that there probably are not biological explanations for why we're seeing these significant differences in, in outcome between the two. Um, cervical cancer is a very, very different story. Uh, one, there are geographical differences in cervical cancer incidence, um, and you can see it very starkly worldwide. Um, here you can see a, uh, the Globacan um, map of cervical cancer incidence, wherever it's red or, or tan is a hot spot. That's an incidence of somewhere between 25 and 56.4 per, uh, per 100,000 women. And you, and you can see the hot spots of southern, uh, southern Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, Central America and South America, Southeast Asia. Um, and then the bottom graph, unfortunately, is cancer mortality rates, and it m pretty much mirrors the same thing, where you see high cancer, cervical cancer death rates in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, Central and South America, and Southeast Asia. And that's what we see in the United States as well. There's a geographic distribution of cervical cancer in this country. Whether you're a non-Hispanic white, you're a non-Hispanic black, you're Hispanic, or you're Asian, there is a particular propensity for cervical cancer incidence in the um, South Atlantic and the Mississippi Valley. 
uh, when you look at, at Asian and Pacific Islanders, you'll see more Western states involved, but still those same hotspots in those areas. Those are areas of large immigrant populations as well, large, uh, often coming from areas where there are no, uh, there is no systematic cervical cancer screening. By and large, cervical cancer incidence and survival over time has gotten better. Uh, the, the, the large story is, a, is, a, is a, a, a growing success story. In fact, between 2002 and 2011, the incidence of cervical cancer, the new cancer cases, have been dropping at about 1.2% each year. And the death rate's dropping even faster. Between 2001 and 2010, it dropped uh, about 1.7% for each year. But despite that improvement for the overall um, population, what you're seeing is that there's still large uh, disparities based on ethnicity. And you, if you look back in 1992 to 2001, Hispanic women had the largest incidence of cervical cancer, with 17.7 per 100,000 in the population. And compare that to non-Hispanic whites, it was only 9.4 per 100,000 in the population. It was 12.8 for African Americans. 10.9 for Asian and Pacific Islanders. But that difference has really shrunk over time. When you, when you fast forward and you look at 2010 tier data, you see that the Hispanic incidence dropped from 17 to 9.6. The incidence in black women dropped from 12.8 to 9.8. And for white women, it dropped, but not as much, from 9 to 7.2. So these gaps are getting smaller in cervical cancer over time, which suggests that they could not have been due to uh, biologic differences in the beginning if they're dropping this quickly and, and starting to close. One of the big differences is the stage at which women present. Um, keep in mind cervical cancer has a screen to pick it up, it's pap smears. And so uh, you would expect that if women are getting pap smears that the majority of women presenting would be doing so with early stage disease. But you see the difference in this slide where early stage disease, what percentage of the women with the cancer present early is blue, and then local regional, meaning it's already spread into the pelvis, is brown, and distant spread is green, you see for African Americans, lower chance of being early, much higher chance of being local, regional, or distant compared to a white woman who has a much better chance of having an early stage cervical cancer diagnosed. And you can see that not much difference between Asians, American, Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Hispanic women with regard to the majority present with early stage disease. Now you may jump to the conclusion that this must mean that black women don't use pap smear screening as much as other groups. Um, but you would be wrong because uh, it has been shown for years that out of women who are eligible for getting pap smears, there's no difference between black and white women when it comes to their use of pap smear screening. Where you see a difference is that Asian women and Native American women tend to uh, have lower rates of screening with pap smears. But the differences in outcome or stage distribution for black and white women cannot be explained by their use of screening. That appears to be the same. Um, some studies have questioned whether uh, the follow-up of abnormal pap smears is the same. And, and studies have suggested that callback rates for black women who have abnormal pap smears are different than the callback rates. So compliance with uh, a callback for an abnormal pap is different between black women and white women. And there's a whole body of literature that's looking at how to make it more effective and, and culturally sensitive to get people to refer um, to come back to the clinic if they have an abnormal pap. When you look at mortality rates of cervical cancer, and this is SEER data between 2006 and 2010, you see that African-American women have almost twice the chance of dying of cervical cancer than white women. 2.2 per 100,000 versus 4.2 per 100,000. Hispanic women, despite the fact of having um, a much higher incidence than any other group, have actually a lower death rate from cervical cancer than black women. And in fact, if I, I don't have this data shown, but in the most recent uh, cancer facts and figures, the Hispanic group actually had a lower death rate than white women. So the cervical cancer picture is changing very, very rapidly and um, clearly not due to genetic differences. So John Farley, um, who happens to be in, at the time he was in the military, he wanted to see if you could look at cervical cancer care and have it equalized 
would you still see these uh, differences? And, and rather than looking at um, GOG trials or SWAT trials, he just looked at cervical cancer care in the U.S. military between 1988 and 1999. It was a large study of over 1,500 patients. Um, and they had an equal distribution of age, stage, histology uh, between white and black patients. Now, in the military, everybody's got the same access to health care, whether you're an officer or you're an enlisted person. Um, you'll have the same access. And, and there were economic differences in this study. There was unequal socioeconomic status. 16% of the whites were officers versus 7% of the blacks. But there was uniform treatment for black and white patients, almost exactly the same rate of surgery, almost exactly the same rate of radiation in both groups. And not surprising, there was no survival difference between black and white women in the US military with cervical cancer over, those, over that time period. Now keep that in mind that in the, the rest of the United States, according to SEER, there was doubling of the death rate of cervical cancer in black women. And yet in the military, there was no difference. What about um, the involvement of a gynecological oncologist or being treated at a, a um, university center? Well, uh, this study looked at those uh, differences, and um, they found that in their study population, there was a higher percentage of black and Hispanic women treated at the public hospital with more advanced stage tumors, but they found no effect of the type of treatment facility on survival, that it didn't matter if you were in a university setting or a public hospital, because all these patients were treated by GYN oncologists. Um, and they found no difference in survival between black and white women who were treated at the university center. So as far as cervical cancer outcome disparities, it, is, it appears that there are other factors other than biology that account for observed differences. And, and some of those differences may be access to state-of-the-art treatment. Um, uh, differences in the callback for uh, abnormal pap smears. And unfortunately, there's little data on racial or ethnic groups other than black women. Um, I'm in the process of, of uh, interrogating the National Cancer Database to answer some very simple questions as far as the role of radical hysterectomy and adjuvant radiation between the two groups. Because there's really, uh, there's a lot of data showing that there's a difference in outcome very little data knowing what is the treatment difference that's leading to it for cervical cancer. So there's a lot of work still left to be done um, with these disparities within this country and worldwide, actually. The last surgery uh, cancer I want to discuss is uterine cancer, because I think it, this really shows the complexity of this question, that it's not one answer for every tumor. And in uterine cancer, you can see that the relative five-year survival has always been the widest between black and white women. In the period between 1983 and 1985, there's a 30% difference in relative five-year survival. You can remember the differences in cervical cancer and ovarian cancer pale in comparison. And these, this level of difference has maintained uh, straight through the 70s to 2001 with all the treatment differences that have been introduced. There was an early study by Connell et al. that was a retrospective single institution study. It was 70 black women, 302 white women with surgically staged endometrial cancer. And that was one of the early studies that showed a biologic difference. What they found was that black women were more likely to have high grade and these poor prognostic cell types of the uterine cancer. There's a very aggressive uterine cancer called the papillary serous uterine cancer. It looks for all intent and purposes, just like ovarian cancer, but it comes from the uterus. And it spreads like ovarian cancer, much more likely to be found outside the uterus at the time of diagnosis. And black women have a higher chance of, if they get endometrial cancer altogether, they're, likely, they're more likely than white women to have these types. And, the, and because of that, they found that race was an independent prognostic factor. Um, <clears throat> so in this study suggested that uh, biological differences play a role in these different outcomes in endometrial cancer. Michael Hicks et al. looked at the National Cancer Database. Um, they, they, it was a large study, 52,000 white women, 3,200 black women, and it spanned 1988 to 1994. They found the same thing. Black women had more papillary serous clear cell and grade 3 tumors. But Hicks went further and he said, well, even if you can control for the cell types, he found an excess death that could not be explained by just biologic differences of the cell types. Um, although it was unlikely to happen in either group, black women were twice as likely to receive no therapy whatsoever. 
So it appears that there are biologic differences in, in uh, endometrial cancer between the groups, and there are social differences interplaying at the same time. Um, as we learn more about the genetics of uterine cancer, you really start to see where, though we are so much alike genetically, that that 0.1% difference can play a significant role. Um, in 1997, Clifford looked at P53 overexpression. And, and P53 is a tumor suppressor gene that when it gets uh, mutated, it tends to be associated with poor prognostic uterine cancers, papillary serous types, clear cell types. Um, in a study of 164 women, they found 28 mutations. That bad uh, mutation was found in 34% of black women versus 11% of white women. And not surprisingly, the recurrence rate was almost twice um, in black women than in white women, 14% uh, in black women, 8% in white. Maxwell in 2000 looked at a mutation that's actually a good prognostic marker, P10 mutation, another tumor suppressor gene. When it's mutated, it, it tends to be associated with the good type of endometrial cancers, what's called endometrioid uh, uterine cancers. Only 5% of blacks had that uh, overexpression versus 22% of whites had it. Um, Santine looked at HER2 new overexpression. Um, this is a proto-oncogene. Uh, you're probably familiar with it because it's overexpressed very commonly in breast cancer. And it has an association with that aggressive uterine cancer, papillary serous. 90% of the black patients in that study had an overexpression of HER2 new versus only 50% of white women. And when you looked at the overall survival at four years in that study, it was 23% for black women versus 63% for white women. So um, there are racial and ethnic disparities in women uh, that affect cancer outcome. And you know, contributing factors include age and socioeconomic status and insurance status for sure, um, access to screening and treatment services, comorbid illnesses, racial discrimination plays a role, cultural beliefs on the part of the patient. Uh, some patients are fatalists and uh, don't believe treating is going to make a difference. Um, High-risk behaviors, compliance with treatment, um, treatment aggressiveness being offered differently, and biologic differences, as we showed with endometrial cancer. So, it's been well documented that these healthcare disparities exist. We see it for ovary, cervix, and uterine cancer. How do we begin to address them? Well, at least for cervix and ovarian cancer, the balance of the data suggests equal care gets you equal outcome. So patients have to be able to receive care. One step is to ensure quality care for all Americans. And while the, American, the Affordable Care Act is not uh, without its, its issues, I think Without universal health care, you cannot begin to address health care disparities. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, but the Institute of Medicine, in a, in a 2002 um, report on health care disparities, said that we have to provide consistency and equity of care through the use of evidence-based guidelines. And you saw from the ovarian cancer disparity data that there's deviation away from evidence-based guidelines, and it affects black women at a higher rate than white women. It affects people without insurance at a higher rate than women with insurance. There's some reason that people are not getting the same treatment. Um, we definitely need increased minority participation in clinical trials. The endometrial cancer story tells you that you cannot extrapolate results from one group to another. There may be biological differences that are valid. Um, we need to increase diversity of the medical workforce. Uh, there's a growing literature showing that patients compliance with treatment is tied to their relationship with their caregiver and that um, patients of the same ethnic background sometimes uh, at their doctor have a higher chance of following the advice of that doctor. And while we've put in a lot of work to document um, the presence and the extent of healthcare disparities, now we have to really start focusing on evaluating interventions that eradicate them. Um, just to say one thing about enrollment uh, on, on trials, when you look at minority enrollment, for example, in the National Cancer Institute clinical trials for colorectal breast, lung, and prostate cancer, there's no question that black and Hispanic women are, have a lower enrollment fraction compared to white women and um, Asian women. And uh, I think we've always thought, well, it's, it's a question of mistrust. Um, this country has a, a history of, of um, you know, experimentation that hasn't uh, gone well very often for minority communicate for communities from the Tuskegee experiments, but there are many other 
examples of it. There's a lack of awareness very often on patients that there are trials even out there. They're not necessarily invited to be part of the trial. They have cultural beliefs that make them not want to participate. They may not be eligible because they have too many comorbid conditions like diabetes and hypertension. Um, and there may be physician lack of awareness. But I thought this paper was really interesting. This, this uh, Dr. Wendler et al. Uh, asked the question, if you if you ask patients to participate on clinical trials, is there any difference of their likely um, saying yes between African Americans, non-Hispanic whites, and Hispanics? And what he showed was that if, whether it's a non-therapeutic trial, a therapeutic trial, or even a surgery trial, that African Americans and, and Hispanics were no less likely to participate when invited onto, uh, onto these trials. And in fact, with surgery trials, which are the most, obviously, the most invasive trials, minorities were more likely to sign up for the trials than non-Hispanic whites. So I think you know, the, uh, the hand-wringing of why we don't have more participation of minority groups in these clinical trials, it's, it's pa patients aren't being invited at the same rate. Um, what about changing the face of the medical community? That's a sort of a, a bleak picture, to be honest. I mean, this is data from um, 2009. It hasn't changed much since that time. But if you look at US medical schools, um, African Americans make up about 13% of the population, about 3.6% of US medical schools. Hispanics, 4.8%. Um, whereas uh, Asians are 14.3% and whites 74%. Um, when you look at US physicians, you see a very similar uh, picture. Um, when you look at cancer doctors, US oncologists, 2% black, 2% Hispanic. And so you say, well, where's the pipeline that's going to feed this and change this? And you look at oncology fellows who are coming out in 2005, not much of a growth here. You see 3% being African American, 4% being Hispanic. So we need to feed that pipeline. And one of the ways is to just expose people earlier. And I'm, I'm proud to say Cornell has a extremely uh, successful program called the Wild Cornell Travelers Program, which began back in 1969. It's a seven-week program. It's offered to 25 undergraduate pre-med students. Um, in, initially, it was restricted to patients from, from to students from historically black colleges, but now it's open to anyone who's interested in studying um, disparities in healthcare. And a large number of these students who participate in this uh, program go on to become doctors. Actually, one of the uh, deans who just um, who just retired was actually a product of this, one of the first classes. So there are healthcare disparities in GYN oncology, and they are persistent. And in some cases, they're worsening, like uterine cancer. In some cases, they're getting better, like cervical cancer. Um, there are multiple factors that contribute to disparities in outcome. But the evidence suggests that equal care results in equal outcome for women with ovarian and cervical cancer. But there are differences in tumor biology that may partially explain disparities in endometrial cancer survival. And so now it's really time for us to focus on research and, uh, and research interventions that effectively reduce um, these documented disparities. And, and that needs to be raised to a top priority. I want to thank you for your attention. That concludes my um, discussion. I'd like to open the floor to any, any questions. Hi, if you all could um, submit your questions to the moderator, which is me, Savannah, but probably you'll see Christine Benjamin. Um, so I'll give you a moment to do that. And in the meantime, we had a couple of questions, Dr. Holcomb, that were submitted previous, previously. Um, the first question is, um, someone who says their mother and grandmother had ovarian cancer, they themselves have breast cancer, she wants to know about her risk of getting ovarian cancer. I'm going to assume that when she says her grandmother, she means her mother's mother, her maternal grandmother, um, and not her paternal grandmother. Um, <clears throat> just having two family members, first degree family members who had ovarian cancer, um, raises your risk uh, from, a, from a background risk of about 1.6%. Um, to about 5% with two first-degree family members affected, which does not sound very high. But that is, uh, your story is concerning for the possibility of you carrying a, a BRCA mutation or some other familial uh, cancer dis predisposition. I would think BRCA is the top one on my list. Um, so if this person who's asking the question has not 
seen a genetic counselor, I would strongly recommend that she does because if she she should test for um, at least a BRCA mutation and and uh, I think with with second generation sequencing and and the possibility of doing a panel, I think it's a good idea to discuss some sort of limited panel with a genetic counselor so you don't just test with BRCA and, and maybe some other lower penetrance genes as well. And if you're found to have a BRCA mutation, then that's, that raises your risk significantly. For example, a BRCA1 mutation, um, by the age of 70, you can have as high as a 40 to 50 percent lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. And BRCA2, while the risk is lower, it's still about you know, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent uh, lifetime risk, which is far higher than that 1.6 percent background. So um, my advice to that patient would be your risk is definitely high enough just based on your history to uh, seek out genetic counseling if you haven't done so already. Thank you. Um, somebody else has sort of two separate questions, a comment and then a question. Um, the comment part is I'm a part of a multi-ethnic family and concerned that so often only elder white women are depicted in the few awareness campaigns that I've seen. Do you have any comment about that? Yeah, I, you know, the, it's, it is a concern. I, I will tell you that sometimes um, we get uh, overly comfortable in medicine and, and think that things are always going to line up in very neat um, columns. For example, ovarian cancer is more common in women of northern European descent. That is for mm -hmm. sure. But to depict every um, poster that you see uh, with an elderly white woman means that when a younger black woman comes in with bloating and crampy abdominal pain and vague symptoms, uh, that very often no one thinks of ovarian cancer because they say, well, that's a disease of older women. Um, it happens sometimes with genetic counseling. I get patients who come to me sometimes for an abnormal pap or some other issue. And then taking a full history, you get a really scary family history with lots of gene line cancers that can fit into a number of, 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 of um, different syndromes. But people think of BRCA, for example, as a Jewish syndrome because it is more common in Ashkenazi Jewish women. But I, I think we do have to be careful to keep in mind because something is more common in a group does not mean that you should not keep that, that disease in your mind when a patient is presenting with uh, those type of symptoms. So there's the potential of having the patient not think of ovarian cancer because she doesn't think she's at risk because she's never seen a poster with her face on it. Um, and there's the risk that the doctor will have the same bias uh, because they're not thinking of it and it's in the back of their mind. Um, I have to say I've seen a change uh, to me over the last few years. Most of the, at least the Society of G1 Oncology, the um, Foundation for Gynecologic Cancers, I, I think that they're doing a better job nowadays with their, um, their handouts showing a much more diverse uh, group of women with, with these diseases. So I, I'm not sure if you still, the patient, or the woman who posed the question still sees it the same, but I, I myself see a difference. Thank you. Um, same person also says, um, I have Lynch syndrome and I'm interested if there's any correlation or disparity with genetic ovarian or endometrial cancers. I have to be honest, I'm not aware of any I'm not aware of any data that has looked specifically at um, Lynch syndrome or uh, or BRCA mutation carriers to see if there's a difference in outcome um, compared to uh, general population. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, compared between ethnic groups who have the um, the uh, the mutation. I know there's, there's an emerging literature saying that women who have BRCA mutation associated ovarian cancer appear to have better survival than women with sporadic ovarian cancers. But differences between ethnicity within that group, I'm not aware of any data on that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, what can we as survivor advocates do to help in this area? Well, I, I think um, one is just keep pushing for funding for research. I, I think one of the things that I worry about is, as I see in the, the climate of, of, of um, you know, financial pressure, uh, one of the first things I get on the chopping block seems to be money for research. And, you know, we all are looking for the 
magic bullet that's going to cure cancer, but I, I don't think that sometimes we put enough money and effort into the low-hanging fruit. If, if, if we can find out that, that travel is an issue for patients and that the distance that people are traveling to get care may be uh, partially explaining a difference in an outcome, uh, the money needs to be put in into uh, making sure everyone has the same access, even if it means you have to travel to a, se a center of excellence. Um, and so I think just advocating for keeping this um, funded, this research, and keeping this as a top priority, uh, I think it carries a lot of weight. And you know, survivor groups have done a lot of work with with maintaining research. Um, funding on a, on a whole host of, of issues and keeping pressure up on, on Congress and, and local politicians that they support these endeavors. So I think that's, that's one thing that you can continually do. The other is doing things like what Cher is doing tonight. I mean, you know, keeping the topic on your agenda. Um, you know, we're, we're in a city where uh, above 125th Street, there are infant mortality rates and cancer mortality rates that are similar to some third world countries. And, and that should not be tolerated in New York City. Um, so I, I think we just have to keep it, keep it up and, and uh, make sure that folks are aware. Thank you. I'll give everybody one last chance for submitting a question. And uh, while, while I do that, I'd like to really uh, thank you so much, Dr. Holcomb. That was a great presentation. Felt like you made it. Um, some confusing data, very digestible, and uh, well, I, really, I hope so. <laughs> and I, I'm fascinated by the comparison between the three different kinds of cancer and the, and the difference. I felt like it helped um, illuminate things to think about in each area. Um, so thank you so much for your time. It was my pleasure. Um, and for all of you, I'm just going to check, make one sure nobody else. Oh, I have one more question. Um, personalized medicine and ethnicity, with the the topic. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, just uh, personal. I, I think sometimes I have to sort of define personalized medicine because the person who's asking the question may know uh, what they mean by it and what it means. But I, I feel like it's a term that's being thrown around a lot, and I don't think everyone really understands what it means. So, personalized medicine is just um, uh, trying to figure out what somebody is going to respond to rather than just by looking at what a cancer looks like under a microscope, the way we've classified tumors for decades, and doing these classifications and treatment decisions based on um, either expression of biologic modifiers or growth factors or, or mutations that there are what we call actionable targets. There's a drug already made out there that, that hits that thing that your tumor uh, overexpresses. And so tumors are being sequenced very often and, and to interrogate and look for things that are overexpressed where there's a drug out there that maybe isn't usually used for your type of tumor. I'll give you an example. Um, you may have uterine cancer and find out after sequencing your tumor that there is a HER2 new overexpression. And Herceptin, which would never have been thought of being used in uterine cancer, may now be on the table as a treatment option because you found out your tumor has that in common with many breast cancers. The proof that your tumor will respond as well as a breast cancer that overexpresses her to new is where we're still lacking in the proof. Um, so that's personalized medicine. is just, <clears throat> and it doesn't always have to be genetic. I mean, even just understanding an ovarian cancer that low-grade ovarian cancer doesn't respond to chemo the way high-grade ovarian cancer. And maybe one should be treated hormonally and the other one treated with chemo. And just, uh, just personalizing medicine based on what we know about the tumor other than just what they look like. Now the question would be, is there an ethnic difference in personalized medicine? Um, and, and yes, you, you saw in uterine cancers, when we looked at those markers, her 2 new was overexpressed in 90% of the women with African-American women who had uh, uh, uterine cancer in that study, compared to a much lower percentage of the white women. So theoretically, Herceptin should be, uh, if, if you had to say, is that drug going to play more of a role in African-American women or white women? It's going to play more of a role in African-American women. They tend to have those poor prognostic types that are overexpressing those markers. I think what we're going to see over the years to come, and I hope it doesn't take 
too long to find out, is that better than what we're doing now? I think that is, that is the um, the question, and I and I'm hopeful that we're going to see that we've been classifying tumors and probably treating a number of people the wrong way, but it it is not a given. It, it is not a a given at this point. I, I sometimes get the feeling that the enthusiasm um, for personalized medicine, and when the president mentions it in the uh, State of the Union address and saying this is something that we need to do. I do, I do want to see it done, but I'm not convinced yet that this is the answer. It's just it needs to be investigated. Um, but you, I am almost positive you will find ethnic differences when you start doing uh, sequencing of everyone's tumors. Um, okay, that answers the question. Yes, there was a follow-up question of would personalized meds overcome racial and ethnic disparities, but the person feels that they that you answered the question. Um, there was a follow another question about access to genomic data. Um, the, the question being, Not oh, sure. for that, for their, yeah. if they're talking about their personal tumor, for example, mm -hmm. because you know there's a human cancer atlas, um, which is not going to speak specifically of your tumor. So I'm going to assume the person wants to know if I want to know about my own tumor's genetics, how could I have that done? And there are a number of uh, companies that offer these tests, and that, that number is increasing because the, um, the cost of sequencing these tumors is getting cheaper and cheaper. There's something called foundation uh, medicine that does it. But increasingly, hospitals are having their own institutes. Cornell has an institute called um, the Institute of Personalized Medicine. And they offer a service where your tumor um, and, and in most cases, they can do it off of archived specimens, things that are already paraffin embedded. They will see if they can extract enough DNA. They will sequence your tumor. They will give you a very comprehensive report of what they found, if there are any actionable items. They give you a really comprehensive bibliography of what that overexpression meant in the tumors where that drug is already approved. They can't usually tell you about what's going to happen with you, but they'll give you some uh, potentially some new uh, options on the table that you didn't have before. Um, so uh, it's our Institute of Perf uh, Personalized Medicine is, is um, it's actually called a Precision Medicine Institute. It's run by a guy named Mark Rubin, who's a pathologist. He started most of his work in urology, looking at prostate cancers. But they're very interested in looking at GYN tumors. Um, and so I've had a number of patients have their tumors um, uh, sequenced, and in some cases there are drugs that are put on the table that weren't there before. In other cases, it's they they sequence the entire tumor, and there really isn't anything that comes out new from the analysis. But um, if the person is interested in having it done, they Cornell has it. I'm sure lots of other hospitals are offering um, a similar service. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right. I I think that is the last call for questions. Um, again, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, please do um, check out our website, anybody that's listening, for further educational programs and webinars that we will be hosting, um, sharecancersupport.org. Um, also, so you know or anybody that you know that was not able to be on the webinar tonight live, we're going to be posting a recording of this webinar on our website probably in the next few days, and you will be notified when it's ready to listen, to be listened to. Um, uh, please do for everybody listening, um, once you sign off, there'll show, there should be an evaluation form that pops up. Um, if you would please fill it out, it really helps us and